If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of James, chapter 4, uh, specifically verse 13 is where we are going to be headed. Before we get too uh, much ahead of ourselves, I want to do a quick introduction for maybe those who, who don't know me. My name is Jeff Heitzman. I have been the youth pastor here at Celebrate Family Church for about six, close to seven years. I also do have a full-time job at Capital One where I work Monday through Friday. I have an amazing wife of seven years. Uh, she comes up and, and does worship every other week. Uh, her name's Kelsey, and so we've been happily married for seven years. We have three uh, boys. We have uh, Eli, who is five, Miles, who is two, and Ezra, who is actually six months today. And so uh, three wonderful boys that have been a part of our family. And today we are going to continue in this gym class series in the book of James chapter four. And my assignment is, is, is discussing the will of God with you this morning. Before we jump into James four, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word. Lord, that it it speaks to us, that it changes us, that that it molds us into who you want us to be. Lord, I pray, Lord, that this wouldn't be my words or my opinions, but Lord, the Holy Spirit being the one that leads me. Lord, help me become less so you become more up here. Lord, help me to realize, Lord, that I am just the vessel that you had chosen to to speak your word here this morning. And Lord, be with us, change us, help not one person leave this place, open up our hearts and ears and help not one person leave this place without being challenged or convicted in an area, Lord, that they need to change. We thank you in all of this, in your name, amen. Now, before we dive into the book of James, I always tell the youth students, context is the most important thing when reading and studying scripture. We need to understand who was the author, who, who was the recipients of the book, what is the main purpose that the author is trying to get, how would they read it in the language and, and, and understand it at the time that it was going. So we need to understand who James is, we understand who he is writing to and what is going on in this specific time. Who is James? And this is a quick refresher of the first week that we did the book of James. James is, yes, the half-brother of Christ, but we also find out that James was uh, not a a believer of who Christ was in the beginning. That James, as half-brother, didn't buy into the whole uh, Christ being the Messiah thing, his half-brother being the Messiah. He was one of the of the family members who called Jesus crazy or, or that he needs to get his, uh, his brain checked for, for some mental stuff. We don't see him at the trial during Pontius Pilate's trial to defend his brother. We don't see him at the cross either weeping with his mother. James is, 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 is at this time an unbeliever, but we also see in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus appears to him after his death and resurrection, and he appears to James, and then we see, based upon James 1, that he says, I'm a servant of Christ, that James is now a believer in who his half-brother is. And we know that this happened fairly quickly after the resurrection, because uh, James is actually the first New Testament book written. It was, uh, scholars believe it's between the 7 and 12 years after the death of Christ, and it's the first New Testament book written. So this happened early on to James, and so we see James, yes, a half-brother, but also now a believer who has been converted to Christ. We also know that James is the leader of the church of Jerusalem. As the disciples and the apostles went out to spread the word, someone needed to stay, and James stayed and led the church, the home church, the base church in Jerusalem. We see that in the council of Jerusalem, where the Judaites tried to uh, add the Jewish traditions and, and, and Jewish rituals to Christianity, James then calls the apostles and disciples back to the council to discuss and and to confirm what Christianity actually was. And this is why you see James speaking so bluntly and so black and white to these people in the book of James. This is why he's not trying to describe things greatly. He's just going to come out and say, this is how it is. And the heartbeat behind the book of James is ultimately saying, you who say you are a Christian, this is what your life is to look like. James is saying, this is what you who call yourself a Christian, this is what your life is supposed to look like. So he's going to speak a a matter of factly or pretty bluntly to these Christians by saying, this is what it is. And we see that in verse 13, where he says, now listen, you who say. Now listen, you who say. And he takes this from a lot of Old Testament prophets who would say the same kind of thing in a a smirking remark like, oh, you who say this, or come listen to me, actually listen to what I'm saying. So he's kind of taking this as an authority figure because he is the leader of of the church in Jerusalem. So when he's telling these people this, he's saying, listen good to what you are saying. Understand this concept. He He is bringing it to the fold. Let's read James 4, 13 through 17. 
Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why? Do you, why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes that all such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and does not do it, it is sin for them. What James is showing here is that there's three ways to handle the will of God. There's three ways to handle the will of God. The first way is to handle it foolishly. And that is to believe or to act or or to not uh, go for God's will at all. To believe that God ultimately does not have a will and that our will is superior and I'm just going to do it. I'm in ultimate control. I don't really care what God has to say about my will or I don't even believe in God and so he must not have a will. And he's saying that that is foolish to do so. Read again where it says, Today or tomorrow we will go to that city. They have already said that this is what they're going to do. They're going to go to this place. Then they say that we are going to do what they're going to do. They're going to carry on business. They already have a plan of where they're going to go. They have a plan on what they're going to do. They even plan their success that they're going to make money. They even plan their success in this. And so much so what James is not saying is that planning is a bad thing. Now, don't get it wrong. James is not saying that planning is a bad thing. If you are a business owner or a leader of a family or or on a sports team or anything like that, basically anything in life, you should always still plan for the future. James is not saying do not plan. None of these things in and of itself, individually, alone, being said here is a sin. It is what is not being said. It is what is not included that is the place of sin, and that is that they are not including the will of God. They are not going for, they are not asking, they are not trying to be a part of. They are in themselves trying to control what they are doing. And James calls that foolishness because he ultimately says, Who are you? Do not even know what will happen tomorrow. You are but a mist, a vapor that is here today and gone tomorrow. What James is pointing out is that God is who he is and we are finite and that how, how can we think that we have ultimate control over things? What he's saying is that God, who, 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 is, who is in control of these things, this is what our life should be. It's foolishness to think that we can control. And he says, you can't even control tomorrow. How are you going to control your success? How are you going to be able to control these things? And so the first way he says is that it's foolishness to, 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 to take God's will and to say that he doesn't really have one or to, or, or to just ignore it. But in verse, two, or in verse 16 through 17, he says, As if you would boast in your arrogant schemes, all such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good that they ought to do and does not do it, it's sin for them. The second way that we handle God's will is that we know God's will. We know that God has a will for us, and maybe we even understand what it is, but yet we suppress it. We do not do it in and of itself. Why? Because it doesn't match what our will and our desires are. And so we take our will and we we try to do God's will in a a partial way or or just ignore that part or that calling and we try to say, well, our will is is, going to be done and and maybe we'll do God's will if we get around to it and we suppress it and, and, and we don't fully go for it. So we can handle it foolishly or we can handle it trying to suppress it because it doesn't line up with ultimately our will. The last way that we can handle God's will is knowing and then doing the will of God. And we see this in verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. See, it is, it is, is our heartbeat, it should be our heartbeat, it should be our desire as Christians then to live and to do the, the will of God. It should be our goal from here on out of the rest of our life once we became a Christian to do the will of God, to do the will of God. First Peter 4, 2 says, As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil, evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. Colossians 4, 12, Who is the one... Uh, Ephesus, who is the one who, who is one of you and servant of Christ Jesus, sends a greeting. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you might stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. See, it is our heartbeat. It should be our desire to walk in God's will. And it's to be our desire to be led by the example of Jesus Christ, who said in John 6, 38, that he did not come to do his will, but to do the will of him who has sent me. We are to walk in God's will will. Now God ultimately has a sovereign will, a providential will in this life that he will bring things to pass that that no matter what we do, whether evil or good, he will bring to 
pass, and, and, and it will happen. He has a sovereign will over his creation. And we see this example in Psalms 33 as I turn to it. My youth students, I always tell my youth students I'm going to mark the places I'm turning to, and I never do. One day I will learn. <laughs> Psalms 33, 9. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of nations and he thwarts the purpose of his people. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purpose of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches. All who lives on earth he will form the heart of all who considered everything they do. Isaiah 46, 10. I make known... The end from the beginning in ancient times is what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. And then Ephesians 1.11. In, we, in him we were all chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. God has an ultimate sovereign will that his plans will come to pass and that what he wills will be done. And that's a great truth for us because now we can stand upon the promise that he is working all things for our good. For if he was not in control, then that promise would be void. But he says that he can control all things, that he, he has a sovereign plan for all things and that we can stand on that promise. But God also does have a will for us as individuals, as his people, as Christians. He has a, a will for us to do he has a will for us to do the problem is is that many people believe that this will is hidden or some sort of mystery and that we have to find like God's playing a spiritual game of hide and seek with his will one of my favorite games as a kid when when we would go to my grandma's for Christmas Eve is my grandma had three little raccoon statues they're about this big and me and my sister and my cousins would, would would take turns hiding the raccoons and then we would all come down and we would try to find the raccoons as fast as we possibly could but sometimes some people were really good hiders and we could not find them and so we would change that then to tell me if I'm hot or cold tell me if I'm hot or cold and some of us do this with God's will where we try to achieve this and we play the spiritual hide-and-seek game, asking God, are we hot close to your will or are we further away from your will? Which is an okay thing to do, but the question for me was, was, was really uh, stuck with me was this. If God has a will for me to do, if God has a will for me to do, and then he's going to judge me based upon how I do that will, and the Bible also says that he is loving and just, why would he hide it? Why would it be a mystery? And so much so that I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, where is it? And I think that God isn't, God's saying that he's not, he'd never hit it. We just didn't know where to look. Or we have forgotten where to look. Read Psalms 143.10. It says, teach me to do your will. This is David speaking. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. Notice that David doesn't say, unhide your will, unlock the mystery of your will, show me your will. He says, teach me so I can do your will. Now it's not so much about finding it or trying to, uh, uh, to unlock the mystery of it. It's about doing, accomplishing, and doing that. And so if God ultimately has a will and, and he says that he has revealed his will for us so that we can walk in it, then what is God's revealed will for us? For the remainder of the time, we're going to go through the six things that the Bible says that this is God's will. Number one, and we'll go through these quickly. Number one, God's will for us is to be saved. God's will is salvation. John 6, 39 says, And this, will, this is the will of him who has sent me, that I shall lose none of those who, who he has given me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life and will raise them up on the last day. First Timothy 2, three. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. God's will for us, as first revealed will for us, is to be saved is to be saved. So much so that he has made the foundations to be saved before the beginnings of the earth, he said, that the plan of redemption was given, the plan of, and the promised Messiah was promised and foreshadowed throughout the whole Old Testament, that it was as good as confirmed and then, and then finally affirmed and fulfilled in the New Testament with Jesus Christ's death on the cross. We see that God's will is for us to be saved. But what does it actually mean to be saved? And what I worry about is, is that we take this word salvation and, and, and we throw it on top of a lot of things. And we, and we take this word and we don't really understand what it means to truly be saved. Because we have to ask the question ultimately is what are we saved from? What are we saved from? Are we saved from our hurts? 
our fears, bad people, illness, sickness, all those things, our addictions, our past addictions, our past sins, yes, that is part of salvation. God comes and, and, and that's plot, part of the redeeming work of the cross is that those things will happen, whether it happens here on earth or in heaven, those things are, are, are to come and, and they will happen. That is part of salvation, absolutely. But what about the people who believe that they're living a perfect life now? What about the people who have these things, who've never been addicted, who've never been sick or, or have an illness, they have a great job, and, and they're living their life, and they're thinking that everything is perfect, and society tells them that everything they have is perfect. What then is this salvation that we offer that they can have a changed life? What it ultimately is salvation. See, a lot of things in this world can temporarily change something for the better whether that be medicine or therapy or a boy or a girl. I work with you students. A boy or a girl can change someone's life uh, in that area. A job, a large sum of money. All these things can change a life for people. In, the world offers these things to people that can change lives. However, what does it mean to be saved? What are we actually saved from? We're saved from our sin. We're saved from the, 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 where the Bible says that we are enemies of God, that we are underneath his judgment, his, his righteous and just wrath when we do not repent of our sins. And the Bible says that out of repentance and out of salvation, out of the work of the cross, then we are connected with God, that our unholiness is now matched with his holiness because of what Christ, is, Christ did on the cross. It is a repentance of our sin. It's a changed life due to the repentance of our sin and, and to understanding that now we are connected with a holy God. An unholy person, an unrighteous person like myself is now connected to a holy and righteous God again. That is what salvation is. That is what God's will for us is to be in salvation. The second will that God has revealed to us to be in, to be in. It is God's will for us to be spirit-filled, to be spirit-filled. Ephesians 5.17 says this, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. The word filled in this case is the Greek word polero, which means to be controlled by or in control of, or control, that, they, that, that what that is filling you is in control, which is why they bring it back to the drunkenness. Do not be uh, foolish and, 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 and do not get drunk on wine. See, what the pagans would do to get into a spiritual realm or, 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 or to try to get into a spiritual thing was to unhitch their mind from their body and to, and to hit the spiritual realm by either drinking a large sum of wine or, or, or taking drugs or, or cutting themselves, as we see uh, a couple times in the Old Testament, they're trying to talk to uh, Baal. And, and, and so we see that they're trying to unhitch themselves from this. But the Bible says here that we need to be controlled by the Spirit. This controlled word in filled has been used multiple times in Scripture. Jesus uses it in John 16, 6, when he says that his disciples were filled with fear and grief, that they were controlled by their fear and grief. And Jesus also uses it in Luke 6, 11, where he says the Pharisees were filled with anger, as in controlled by their anger. And so we are to be spirit-controlled. The spirit is to be controlling us. And the good news is, is that if you are saved, we have the spirit of Christ in us. Romans 8, 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. What Romans 8 is, is saying is that if you are saved, the spirit of Christ comes to you. It's a, it's a thing together. But what does that mean? Because if we have the Spirit of Christ, how do we actually be controlled by it? What does it actually mean? Because if we have the Spirit, it's not, it doesn't mean that we are always controlled by it. What does it mean to be controlled by the Spirit? Colossians 3.16. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs of Songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. We see that being controlled by the Spirit is to understand and to know and to live out the Word of God. For it is the Holy Spirit that inspired Scripture, it is the Holy Spirit that wrote Scripture, it is the Holy Spirit that interprets Scripture, it is the Holy Spirit that convicts our life to the Scriptures, it is the Holy Spirit that applies the Scripture to our life. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God never were work alone they are together working in tandem and so to live and to be spirit-filled or to be controlled by the spirit is to know God's word and to do God's 
word. That way that when we know the promises of God, all the promises of God, we know who he is and we understand his plan. So now that when we go pray for people and led to pray for people and led to pray for healings, we understand of God's promises. And so now we can pray with a deeper aspect. We can worship with a deeper aspect because we understand who God is and what he's doing and what his promises and what the gospel means. And we can evangelize in a way better way knowing that the, that knowing God's Word. To be spirit controlled is to be controlled by God's word, to live, to know, and to do God's word. And let the spirit guide you in, into who to share with or who to pray with or, or, or in, your, in your personal prayer time. To be controlled by the spirit. The third thing that God has revealed to be his will is to be sanctified. To be sanctified. First Thessalonians 4, 3. It is God's will... It doesn't seem like that's hidden at all. It just says right there, it is God's will. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God, and that in the manner that no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all of these who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. What does it mean to be sanctified? It means to be separate. Separate from what? Separate from our sin. It means to never be content as long as evil desires and temptations come across our mind. It is to be never uh, ending in repentance. Repentance was never supposed to be a one-time thing at salvation. It was supposed to be an ongoing lifestyle in your life. David shows this as as he repents repeatedly in the book of Psalms for all of his sins. David repents to continue in salvation and into Repentance. It ultimately means to look more and more like Christ every day, to begin to look like him. Now, this sanctification is a walk. It is not, it is not a sprint. Our goal is to not just try to achieve this overnight because it's going to take a while. That's why we walk with Christ. It's a journey and pace yourselves on this race and run the good race and don't give up on this race. It is not a sprint, nor is it like a level in a video game where you're trying to get to top 100 level of of sanctification and now you're the holiest person in the church. That's not what James, er, er, it's, it's not what the Bible is talking about. Being sanctified doesn't mean that you are ever going to be without sin. It doesn't mean that you are not going to sin. It just means that you have the power not to sin. 1 John 1.8 says this, actually, for those who believe that they are without sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. See, sanctification doesn't mean that we are going to uh, achieve perfection, per se. We're not going to always... Never not sin, that it's not going to be that, but what it's saying is that we have the power through what Christ did. We have a new relationship with our sin, that we are no longer locked and enslaved in sin, that we have the power to say no and to defeat sin through what Christ did on the cross. So God's revealed will is for us to be saved, for us to be spirit-filled, sanctified. Number four, and this might be a hard one to swallow, especially here in America, to be submissive. God's will is for us to be submissive. 1 Peter 2.13 Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether an emperor or as the supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of the foolish. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect for everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your master, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also those who are, are harsh. We see this also in Ephesians 5 where it says, Wife, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church. It says, Kids, obey your parents. Submit to your parents' authority. Parents, do not chastise your kids. Or fathers, do not do that. And, 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 and to give, to uh, submit to the government. Submit to bond servants and slaves. Submit to your masters. In 2018, we would call them bosses. It says that we need to be a good employee. We need to be a good wife, a good husband, a good kid, a good parent to our children. And to submit to the authorities of our government and to the leaders that God has put in place. We need to submit. It is election, obviously, coming up on Tuesday with the phone calls and the amount of mail and things I have gotten uh, in my mailbox that is coming up. God has required for us to submit to the authorities, to the government that that, that are in power. 
We are to be submissive to them, knowing that God is the one who is in control and who has put them there for his purpose and his will, and that we are to pray for them. This is exampled in the Old Testament multiple times as Moses, who is the leader of Israel at this time, they're walking around in the desert and they come up to Edom and they're trying to go through this spot of land and the land is a much quicker way, it's a much safer way than going around Edom and, and it's technically not in the city walls of Edom but, but it's on the outskirts of it and, and, and Moses doesn't just go across it being like, I'm the leader of Moses, therefore I can go and do what I please. Instead, he goes to the king of Edom and asks for passage through that Pacific spot of land. He submits to the authority of a pagan king. King of Edom says no, and they go around instead. David and Saul is another perfect example of someone who is submitting to an authority, even to the point of facing death from that. David has a chance to kill Saul, but he does not and says, I will not touch God's anointed, that, I, that God has put Saul in, in leadership for a purpose and for his will, and that it will be done. And so I, David, who am I to bring upon my will over this? And ultimately, we see this example in Christ. Now, when I say submit, it doesn't mean that you are less valuable. It doesn't mean that you are less of worth. It doesn't mean that you have less meaning than that of what you are submitting to. That is not what the Bible is teaching. It means that you have a specific different purpose or role in God's will. It is not. Look at Christ. He is not less of a deity. He is not less powerful. He is not less worthy of our praise. He is not less than God in any way. But yet he repeatedly, re- repeatedly submits to the will of God. Nowhere in, in Scripture do you see that Jesus says, God, you've been reigning for 4,000 years as Father. You've been reigning for 6,000 years as Father. Why don't you give me a shot to do this whole God thing, and then you can come down and do this instead. Nowhere does Jesus ever say that I need to not submit to the Father. He knows that it is not about his value or his worth, but it's about his purpose and role. The same with us being submissive to our husbands and to our wives and to our children and to our bosses and to our government. Number five, suffering. Is it God's will really for us to suffer? That doesn't seem to make sense. 1 Peter 3.17 For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Now what we're talking about here in suffering is not uh, unnecessary suffering that just happens because the world is evil or fallen. We're not talking about sinful suffering that happens because of our sins. What we're talking about is suffering for righteousness sake. As Matthew 5 says, blessed are those who suffer for righteousness sake. It means that that we understand that the world is a lost and depraved place, that, that we are coming with this, this truth that there is one way to Christ. There is one God, one way, one salvation, and it is through Jesus Christ. It is singular, and the truth stings those who do not want to hear it. The flesh wants to rebuke those things and that we who are bringing upon that message is going to suffer ridicule and persecution because of it. The people who James is writing to is in the midst of the, of the most persecution given by the, to the church at this time as Romans and even Jews are, 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 are going against them and trying to wipe out this Christian faith. And so we see that he is saying that we need to be Standing in suffering, 1 Peter 4, 19 says, So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to be faithful to their Creator and to continue to do in good. I don't know where we got lost in this, and, and, and maybe it's an America church thing that we should not suffer at all because in first, or in Second Timothy 3, 12, it says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. We're bringing a message of hope and truth, but that message of hope and truth is also singular, and the flesh does not want to hear it. And so we need to stand in that suffering. God's will is for us to suffer for his purpose, for his goodness, for his will. And what great amount of rejoice we can have that we are enjoying or being part of the suffering that the disciples and the apostles and the Old Testament prophets and Jesus Christ himself participated in. The Bible says to rejoice in that, that we too get to share in the suffering with Christ. And then last one, God's will is for us to be saying thanks in all things. To be saying thanks in all things, 1 Thessalonians 5.16. Through 18. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will 
for you in Christ Jesus. To give thanks in all things, this is going back to where James in the beginning of his book said, consider it pure joy when trials come. Because why can we give thanks in all things? Because we understand that the of the suffering that we are doing is building character, is persevering us, is refining us to who God wants us to be. And he's saying, give thanks in all things, pray continually in all things, so that way you have a deeper understanding and worship uh, for me. That now it doesn't matter your circumstances when you come here to worship on a Sunday morning. It doesn't matter your emotions that you're feeling. It matters that God's name be glorified, and that is your heart's desire. It's not emotions that now you have to stir up and try to get and wake yourself up for prayer or for, or for worship. It is, it is because of God's word and his truth and his spirit flowing through you that now creates the emotions and now you have nothing else other to do than to rejoice and worship God, to give thanks in all things. So God's revealed will for us, what he wants us to live in is to be saved, to be spirit-filled, to be sanctified, to be submissive people, to be suffering in righteousness for righteousness' sake, and for saying thanks in all things. That is the revealed will of God. Now, some of us are out there and we're saying, well, that doesn't help me make choices in my life. That's not the will of God that I was talking about is mysterious. How do I know what job to take? How do I know what school to go to? How do I know if I should take this move and and move to a different place? How do I understand what what all those things are, and how do I make that choice? Should I buy that car or should I not buy that car? Should I buy this house or buy that house? How in the world? What should I do with the rest of my life as I work with teenagers and and a lot of my students are coming up to that age where they're going to start asking, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? What is that will? This doesn't help me. God doesn't say my will for you is to go to uh, the University of Minnesota. Nowhere in the scripture are you going to find that. What is that? How How do I get to that will? Well, my question for you is, if we are not walking in the will that God has revealed to us, what makes us think that even our desires to to do certain things are even his desires at all? God is saying that if you walk in my revealed will, then then and only then will my other will or, or this will be revealed to you. Because now it is not your desires, it is not your will that is being done, it is ultimately God's will. Psalms 37, 4 says this, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Now many of us will take that and we're saying, oh, God's going to give me all my desires, but we forget the first part. Delight in the Lord. What does that look like? Doing and walking in the revealed will of God. Are you saved? Are you spirit-filled? Are you sanctified? Are you submissive? Are you suffering for righteousness' sake? Are you giving thanks and saying thanks in all things? Are you doing those things? Because ultimately, if you are, then whose desires are in your heart? It is no longer yours, it is God's. And so no matter where you go, what school you choose, what job you decide to take, where you decide to move, God's saying that I am going to be with you because you are walking and this is my desire for you. These are the ideas that I have placed in your heart. These are the desires that I have placed in your heart. And I know this to be true because 10 years ago, if you would have asked me, a boy who stuttered through uh, his, his middle school days, who had to give speeches and got laughed off the stage, if I, if I would have told you that, that God's will for me was to be up here speaking to you this morning with that speech impediment and conquer those fears and these things, I would have said, no way am I doing this. No way. But as God has saved me, as I came to salvation as he brought me into salvation, as he has controlled me through his word, as, as I have been submissive to those who God has called me to be submissive, as I have been sanctified and becoming more and more like Christ every day, and as I have suffered for righteousness' sake and saying thanks in all things, now I can't do anything but. Amen. Now I can't do anything but. And he is saying that those desires that I have placed in your heart stand free in those things that you want to do, those desires that are beating on your heart because I am the one who has put them there if you are walking in my will that I have revealed to you. What great freedom. What great freedom is that? That life is not a a dot-to-dot type of connection. That God says no matter where you go, I am with you because I am the one who is guiding your steps. Friends, do not act like the will of God is hidden or mysterious. Walk in what God has revealed to be his will and watch the desires that he has placed in your heart and he will fulfill those things. And now we don't have to worry if it's our desires or our will that's being done, but we know and can stand firm that it is his. As the worship team comes this morning.
I was trying to think of a way as there's so many things we could do with uh, the ending here, but with every head bowed and every eye closed. For some here today, they just needed to hear this to be set free, that they are truly walking in the will of God. That the big decisions that they're making in their lives are truly God's desires because they are walking in the revealed will of God. But for some, they had no idea what it was walking into this place. And for some, one of those six or maybe two or or all of them or one, it does not matter, but we have not been walking in that. And so if you fit into any one of those six where you're saying, this revealed will of God I have not been walking in and I want to begin to walk in it this week. I want to begin to, to, to understand what I am truly walking in. I, I understand salvation. I understand being spirit controlled and I have to change some things in my life so that I'm walking in the revealed will of God so I know that my desires and that my will are now equal and lined up and he is the one that is controlling them. So with every head bowed and every closed, if you fit in one of those areas and you just want prayer, prayer today, you can just raise your hand and we'll pray for you. Awesome, hands are going up. Lord, I thank you for each hand that was raised. Lord, it represents uh, a, a soul, Lord, that is coming to you saying, I want to live in your will. As, as, as scripture said that I am now uh, with Christ, I'm saying I am with Christ, and now I need to walk in what you have for me. I need to walk in your will. That my desires and my will lines up exactly with yours. That you will guide my footsteps, that that you will control where I go and what I do based upon your desires. And so, Lord, whatever area it was, Lord, whether it be salvation, Lord, I pray right now, Lord, that they would not leave this place without speaking to someone for prayer over salvation. Lord, if it is spirit control, Lord, I pray, Lord, that they would get a hunger for your word, Lord, that they would understand it. Holy Spirit, illuminate it for them, Lord. Lord, I pray that we would be a church that is sanctified, looking more and more like Christ every day. Lord, help us as... Uh, people, as, as, as your uh, people, as Christians, to be submissive to the authorities and to the people in our lives that you've called us to be. Lord, in love and in prayer, to be submissive, to be a humble people that you've called us. Lord, help us to understand, Lord, that the suffering that we face here on earth is only temporary. Lord, and we can consider it pure joy. Lord, for we will be rewarded for what we do here. And Lord, help us to give thanks in all things, Lord, regardless of the circumstances or the trials or or the things in our life that are going on. Lord, help us to walk in your will, Lord, that we can say thanks in all things, that we can be joyous in all things, that we can give you praise in all things. So for every hand that was raised, Lord, touch their heart. Give them boldness and courage to walk in your will here this week, Lord, and help them to begin to see the desires, Lord, that you have in their life. Lord, many in here have not seen the desires that you have for them, Lord. Unlock it in them, Lord, I pray. Thank you for each person here. Be with them, Father. Walk with them. Encourage them and make them bold. In your name, amen. Thank you all for being here this morning. I hope you have a great rest of your week. We'll be praying for you. On the connection card, there is a spot to mark which one that that you want to be working on this week, and and the pastoral staff can be praying for you this week. Uh, Have a blessed day. Thank you for coming. See you back next week, church. Love you guys.